Well, good morning, everybody, and the Lord be with you. It is very good to see you here, to welcome you here, and, uh, well, welcome you to uh, our service of Holy Communion this morning. It's great to have you here at St. Paul's Church, whether you're joining us here live in the building or whether you're one of the people at home in your pyjamas, lying on the sofa, enjoying church in that way. Welcome to you as well. You might actually be dressed and up and looking very civilised, so I apologise for that assumption. But uh, welcome to everybody uh, to our service today. I want to start this morning just with a couple of notices, if that's okay. Um, and first up um, is just notice of um, a number of you here will, will have known uh, and, uh, and have loved uh, Del and Jean, Del and Jean Summers. Um, and some of you may have heard already that Del passed away last week. Um, his, his funeral is taking place this Friday at midday in here to start with. So we will begin here at midday and then we'll be up to the creme to conclude the service and then coming back here um, for a funeral tea afterwards that the family are inviting everybody to. But it's, uh, yeah, um, hold please the Summers family and Jean in particular in your prayers this week as they prepare uh, to say goodbye to Dell. Um, that's midday Friday of this week. And um, I've had a, a complaint, changing the subject completely, a request um, from Sheena Damon, who many of you will know who works for the YMCA. They've got um, some slots to do some carol singing, I think on the 11th of December in Asda at Castle Point. Now, you might remember a few, I think it was my first Christmas here, a whole load of us dressed up as Father Christmas. And, uh, and we went and sang carols outside uh, Sainsbury's, which was a real hoot. Uh, so this is, an, we're not dressing up as Father Christmas. I've not been told that this time. But um, you can if you want to, you know. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in helping Sheena out and having that witness at ASDA, you know, at this time of year, then just let me know and then I can put you two in touch and the, the groups of carol singers can, can form and uh, provide that witness at ASDA. So that's, uh, let me know. Speak to me afterwards if you're interested in singing carols. And then... Um, Witness, let's carry on the idea of witness. Sam is going to come and say something very quickly about an event that's happening here tomorrow night. Tomorrow's a significant day, um, mostly because we've got Word One to One coming. Uh, it's also my birthday, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I've it's a celebration of Jim's birthday. Uh, you can come and join the Word One to One training evening. You might have noticed that in our country, the Billy Graham Crusades have stopped, and people aren't pouring in their tents to hear about the Lord Jesus in big Lean into this thing. stadiums, sorry. Um, but it is still very possible to get the good news of Jesus out to our friends and families and colleagues. Is that better? Sorry. Don't worry, I was just saying, maybe the days of mass rallies where thousands come to hear of Jesus are not with us at the moment. But there are still loads of ways in which we can take the good news of Jesus to those who don't currently know him and trust him. And this resource, the Word One-to-One, -one, is the thing I'm most excited about as a tool to put in our hands as we take that news of Jesus out to others. It's very simple. It's the Gospel of John in 11 segments. And tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m., the authors, the kind of producers of this resource are coming to speak to us about why um, they produced it and um, how to make the most of it. And you might be sitting here thinking now, I'm sure other people could use that, but I'm too busy, I'm not articulate enough, I don't know the answers, I'm too old to learn something new, whatever it is. Um, I'd encourage you to come along anyway. If you decide it's not for you, then you've only lost an evening. Uh, but my hope and prayer is that we leave thinking that is something I could use. It's very normal. Um, it's um, helpful for someone who thinks of themselves as an ordinary um, Christian. So 7.30 tomorrow night, they're going to explain why they produced it, how to use it. If you're able to come along, do come. You don't have to sign up or anything. And if you'd like a lift, if you don't drive in the evenings, do grab me afterwards and I'll see if we can sort out a lift so that you can get there. Bring your friends. If you're a Mor Moreland's College student, bring your whole year group. <laughs> Bring your home group, 7.30 tomorrow night, do come along. Brilliant, thank you Sam. Thank you Sam. I think the only way the church is going to see growth um, is 
through resources like this, one to one. You know, when we think about how we've come to faith, it's usually because one other person has taken the time to talk to us about Jesus. And that's led to our own commitment. So please come and be a part of that tomorrow. Come and find out about that resource and how to use it. But we're not here for advertisements and notices. We're here um, to worship the Lord. And I don't know what kind of week you've had. Maybe you've had a tough week. Um, I know, for example... Two of our musicians have been unwell this week. I was flattened by um, a, a booster jab this week and, and left feeling unwell. So I, don't know, so I know there's at least three of us coming to this week feeling a little bit kind of less than 100%. I don't know about you. I don't know how you're feeling. Maybe you're coming. Maybe, you know, it was, it was hectic getting the kids ready to get out and come to church this morning. Maybe, you know, husband and wife, you've had a row with one another this morning over something ridiculous. Uh, you know, there can be all sorts of things that make arriving here and being here in the place to worship the Lord utterly difficult. So I'm going to invite you just to take a moment now. I'm going to read a verse that's been coming to me all week. I just want you to take a moment, take a quiet, moment of quiet now and just ask for God to fill you with his spirit. That however you feel, whatever you've been through up to this moment, right now as we come to worship the Lord together. Just ask the Spirit to fill you, that he might empower you to fix your eyes on Jesus. And then hear these words, words of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah. The Lord says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. And help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Father God, we thank you that you speak those words to us. That we need not fear. We need not be dismayed because you are with us. Lord, we pray that you take us as we are. That you would fill us with your spirit as we come to worship you. As we come to gather around your table. Lord God, fill us with your spirit. Draw us closer to you. Help us to leave here knowing that we've met with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Father, thank you that we can trust those words because of who you are. And who we are in you. May you remind us of these truths today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing two songs together now. Uh, in the middle, I'm going to pray the youngsters out. After the first song, I'm going to pray the youngsters off into their, into their groups. But two songs together. Let's stand and worship the Lord in his strength together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he bore me and know his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun says free, always free I'm a child.
by which I have ever displeased you, and I resolve by the help of your grace to commit them no more, and to avoid all opportunities of sin. Help me to do this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our prayer for this week. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service whose kingdom has no end. For he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. So now we're going to hear God's word. Thanks, Lou. The reading is taken from John chapter 18, verses 28 to 40. Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? <coughs> if he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. 
In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Reported, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning to you all. Lovely to see you. And for those I haven't met, my name's Susan, and I'm a licensed lay minister here at St. Paul's. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good thriller, be it on the TV or in a book. Not anything horribly violent, but one that has you trying to work out just what is going on. One that unravels the truth. And the best ones are those that set the scene at the beginning and introduce you to the main characters and have you thinking that you've solved it very early on, maybe even the first chapter, only to turn everything on its head as you realise that everything was not quite as it seemed. Well, recently I enjoyed the programme The Tower, the series that was on, but I did have to turn away a few times because there were some gory bits. (laughs) But it was a TV drama in which things weren't what they first seemed. And as it came to the final episode, it was introduced with the tantalising statement, the explosive truth is revealed. How's that for a trailer? The explosive truth is revealed. And the same could be said about this encounter with Jesus, which we're looking at this morning, which John tells us about. And it's the final sermon in a series we've been looking at, Encounters with Jesus. And we're going to be looking at an encounter between Pilate, the governor of Judea, and Jesus just before his death. And things are not quite what they might seem at first sight. Because at first glance, it may appear that we are reading about the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. But as the truth about Jesus is revealed, I pray that the truth will be revealed and it will not only amaze us, but that it will change our lives. But first, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we look at this account of your final hours on earth, help us to look beyond the immediately obvious and discover within your encounter with Pilate the wonderful truth of who you really are. Amen. Now, talking about drama series, I always have to listen very carefully to that part at the beginning of each episode which summarises what's happened previously. And that's usually because I've managed to fall asleep at the end of the previous episode. So let's quickly remind ourselves of what's been going on before this encounter between Jesus and Pilate. Well, right from the early days of Jesus' ministry, the Jewish leaders have been divided about him. As they've listened to his teaching and witnessed his miracles, There have been those who believe that he is guilty of blasphemy, those that want him arrested and killed. And as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover with his disciples, the Jewish leaders are looking for a way to get rid of him. They want him formally executed by crucifixion in order to dispel Jesus' claim that he is the Son of God. Because according to Jewish law, Crucifixion is a sign of God's curse. So a crucified Messiah 
is, as one commentator put it, as likely as a square circle. And following the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus is betrayed by one of them, Judas Iscariot, and brought before the Jewish authorities where he's charged with blasphemy, claiming to be the Son of God, the Messiah, before being passed on to Pilate. Now, the Jewish leaders know that they're more likely to get the result they're looking for from Pilate if they accuse Jesus of a political offence. So he's charged with inciting people to riot, forbidding the people to pay their taxes, and claiming to be king. And that's where we find ourselves in this passage in John 18, with Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate. So what's the lowdown on Pilate? Well, as Roman governor of Judea, some might say he's an ambitious opportunist, an anti-Semite, and he's hated by the Jews. His is an early case of nepotism. He only got the job because he joined the Roman legion in Rome, met the granddaughter of Emperor Augustus Caesar, married her, and because of this connection, was recommended for the position. Now, in accepting the post, he applied for and obtained the very unusual privilege of being able to take his wife with him. Now, as in most dramas, the seemingly small and insignificant facts can play an important part in the role later. And this is no exception, as we shall see in just a minute. Now, at the time of this encounter with Jesus, Pilate's not in a good standing with Rome, and his position is in jeopardy. I guess we could say that if he was a modern-day football manager, they would be lining him up for the sack. And now, as Jesus is brought before him, Pilate finds himself in a sticky situation. And in many ways, we see a different side to Pilate, because rather than being haughty and overbearing, he seems remarkably anxious to please the Jews, and yet at the same time, unaccountably reluctant to go along with their wishes. You get the feeling that he doesn't want to touch this case with a barge pole, and somehow he wants Jesus acquitted, or at least he wants to pass the responsibility on to somebody else. So why is this? Well, Frank Morrison, in his book, Who Moved the Stone, and I can thoroughly recommend it to you if you want to find out more about the last few days of Jesus' life and the events of the crucifixion and resurrection. If you've got questions about any of that, pick up that book, Who Moved the Stone? He sets out compelling evidence from all four Gospels for the sequence of events of Jesus' last days. And interestingly, he picks up on the likelihood that following Jesus' arrest the previous night, Pilate would have been warned of the proposal to bring Jesus before him the following morning. And Pilate, in all probability, had shared this information with his wife, like wives do. The seemingly insignificant fact that Pilate has allowed his wife with him now becomes very important indeed. Because it's possible that not only does she know the identity of the prisoner, but that Pilate is intending to give formal consent to the wishes of the Jews to have Jesus executed. And with that thought in mind, just listen to what Matthew's Gospel has to tell us. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal in a dream because of him. So the night before the death of Jesus, Pilate's wife has a dream about Jesus, and when she wakes and finds Pilate gone, she sends him this urgent message, don't go near him. But note, she declares him innocent. Don't have anything to do with him. 
She is, in all probability, aware that her husband is likely to sentence Jesus to death and is anxious to stop him and warn him off. And whilst Morrison does not pin down the exact timing of the arrival of her message in the proceedings, he is clear that the result of her warning is that as Jesus is brought before Pilate, Pilate is torn, torn before between two worlds, the material world and the spiritual world. Who is this Jesus who's standing before him? What is the truth regarding him? So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Now, interestingly, all four Gospels emphasise the you. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, to be honest, Jesus doesn't look like a king, standing there in his peasant dress with a bloodied face. But the truth is, he is king, not in the earthly, material sense, but is king of the whole world. He is a spiritual king. In response, Jesus goes for Pilate's heart. Is that your own idea, or did others talk about me? You see, Jesus is challenging Pilate. The tables have been turned. This is not Jesus on trial, but Pilate. Pilate, do you want to know the answer, whether I am a king for yourself for your own heart? Do you want to know who I really am, Pilate? Are you really interested? Do you want to know me personally? Or is this just your motive to get yourself off the hook? Jesus has pushed the button. He challenges Pilate with the most important question he's ever been asked. Is that your own idea? Is it your own idea that I am king of the Jews? Now, to the world looking on, it must seem at this point that the whole world is caving in. But through spiritual eyes, we can see that the complete opposite is happening. Here we see Jesus, beaten and humiliated, holding court over Pilate. It's not Jesus on trial before Pilate, but Pilate on trial before Jesus. The Jewish council, the Sanhedrin are on trial. The whole world is on trial. And Jesus is rendering sentence and taking the judgment. G.K. Chesterton once said, Paradox is truth standing on its head that it may gain attention. Paradox is truth standing on its head that it may gain attention. And that's what's happening here. We're being led to the deepest truth as to who Jesus is. Now, Jesus' question certainly gets Pilate flustered and he evades a direct answer. Am I a Jew? Pilate responds. To which Jesus replies by returning to the heart of the matter, to his kinship and to the fact that his kingship is not of this world. He proclaims himself to be not an earthly ruler, but a spiritual one. Because if Jesus is an earthly king, if he's a threat to the state, then, Jesus says, his supporters would have fought against his arrest. So now Pilate is in a quandary. Because, you see, if Jesus had declared himself a human king then it would be easy enough to have him executed and his wife's premonition would have proved wrong. But how can he convict a man of being a spiritual king? And maybe, just maybe, Pilate is even wondering whether Jesus is who he claims to be. We don't know. You are a king then, says Pilate. Correct, says Jesus. For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. It's interesting, isn't it? On the day he dies, Jesus speaks of his birth. 
For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. It's the only mention in the whole of John's Gospel of Jesus' birth. Jesus, born to be our King, and now here he is on the day of his execution, and he stands before Pilate to testify to the truth. Now the word truth here has a meaning close to reality. Reality. In a world subject to unreality and illusion, Jesus offers the reality of a personal relationship with the only true God, a life that sets people free. How remarkable then that here is Jesus the imprisoned, offering his judge true freedom. Contrary to first impressions, you see, Jesus is fully in control of what is happening. Because the remarkable truth is that Jesus, the judge of the world, is fulfilling his mission to die in your place, in my place, as our substitute taking our sins upon himself, that we might be free. As the Jewish leaders hand Jesus over to Pilate, because according to their law they have no right to execute him, John writes this in verse 32. This happened so that the words Jesus has spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. And as Jesus stands before Pilate, he hits him with this. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. In other words, whoever believes that Jesus is who he says he is, listens to him. As the explosive truth about Jesus is revealed, Pilate and the whole world are given a stark choice to be on the side of truth and listen to Jesus, or to dismiss the truth and turn away from Jesus. There are no other choices. There's no middle ground here. We are either on the side of truth or we're not. For Jesus himself had said previously, whoever is not with me is against me. In other words, we're either in or we're out. You must decide, I must decide, one way or the other, for or against Jesus. There is no third way. Yes, we are free to decide, but we are not free not to decide. Jesus stands before us and compels a choice. So what did Pilate choose? Well, for one fleeting moment, he appears fascinated as he faces the issues of his personal destiny. What is truth? Pilate asks. But he doesn't stay around for the answer because he dismisses the truth even when the truth is stood right in front of him. The explosive truth has been revealed, but Pilate chooses not to believe it. But what about us? When we're confronted by the truth, when the truth is revealed to us as it is here in God's word, what do we do with it? We all need to ask ourselves a very important question this morning. Am I on the side of truth or am I not? Do I listen to Jesus? Now I know how easy it is to find an excuse to dismiss the truth. We can say we're not interested in religion 
like Pilate, we can have a strange fascination with Jesus, but be fed up with the whole church thing. Maybe bad experiences with church or Christians in the past have put us off. Or maybe it's all just too much effort. Like Pilate, we're interested for a fleeting moment, but we can't be bothered to stay around, to hang on in there and find out more. Perhaps we believe we can have it both ways. We try to live by what is right. Even Pilate tries to do the right thing later. But we leave Jesus out of the equation. Maybe we let others make the decision. Pilate later turns to the crowd to decide whether to release Jesus or not. But you know, we can rely on our parents' faith or believe that by coming to church and mixing with Christians, that's somehow enough. But accepting the truth has to be a personal decision because being a Christian is having a personal relationship with Jesus. Or we can worry about the effect a decision for truth will have on our lives, on our prospects. Pilate, I'm sure, is worried about his prospects. But ironically, historical records tell us that not long after he got the sack and committed suicide two years later. We can enjoy the way we live, and we don't want anything disturbing it, thank you very much. Or we can worry what others will say whilst feeling deep down empty and unfulfilled. We live for the here and now, ignoring that one day we will meet Jesus face to face. Well, if any of this applies to you, then look to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Believe in him and accept him for who he is, your saviour the one who took God's curse upon the cross and gave his life that you might live, the one who rose again that you might know eternity with him, the one who loves you with an everlasting love and know that love that passes all understanding. When we reach the final episode of a drama, it's always good to discover the truth. But I admit there are times when I feel a bit let down by the reveal. And that's because we're looking at unreality, a made up story. But as we approach the end of this drama in John's Gospel, we discover a truth that is real, that is life changing. That is world-changing, the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. We just have a moment just to think of where we are this morning. Just to consider whether we are on the side of truth. And just come before Jesus and ask him to reveal himself, the truth, to you this morning. Pilate asked, what is truth? Lord Jesus, I pray that for everyone who asks this question here today, you will reveal yourself to their hearts that they may know the truth and the truth will set them free. Amen. next song continues
everything that Susan was just saying. That truth that we can build our life upon is our living hope. Our next song starts with how great the chasm that lay between us and goes on to say how that chasm is sorted. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's stand and worship him in song.
as we stand, we declare our faith in that living hope together. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Do take a seat as we're led now in prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Lord, we've just declared our faith together, united together in love for you. We give thanks today for those who you've raised up in every age to reflect the light of Christ and to teach us the truth. We give thanks for those who boldly declare the truth and continue to communicate the gospel in a changing world. As we discern this truth, give us the boldness and confidence to share our faith with others and to bring hope to them. We give thanks for the Word one-to-one -one resources, and we pray that you will equip us by your Spirit to use them with our friends. Guide us, we pray, as to who we may use these resources with. Open our ears to your voice. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who have power and influence amongst the nations, that they may find their wisdom and strength in you. And we join with the daily prayer of the House of Commons by asking, Lord, that you will grant our Queen and her government, to members of Parliament and all in positions of authority, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, a desire to please or unworthy ideals but laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keeping in mind their responsibility to seek and improve the condition of all mankind so that your kingdom may come and your name be hallowed. We pray too for our security services and all who seek to protect us. Give them your wisdom and guidance as they seek to do this on a daily basis. Give them strength to endure and persevere in their work and protect them from physical and psychological harm, we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you for those who live out their vocation in family life. We pray that you will give grace to all who nurture children and all who care for parents and for siblings. In your mercy, sustain those who care for others. Give them what they need for the moments and days ahead. Give them refreshment when tiredness overwhelms and your strength to sustain. We give thanks for the knowledge and skills of medicine, but we know, Lord, that pain and suffering continue. Amidst our uncertainties, may we find comfort in the knowledge of your undying love for us. May the peace that you left us, the peace that you gave us, be the peace that sustains and saves us. We pray today in particular for Jean and the family as they mourn Dell. Give them strength and hope in you, our risen Lord. We bring before you to those known to us who need your strength and comfort and healing hands at this time. We pray for Alexander, Daniel and Trish's nephew. 
for Rosemary, for Ernie and Josie and the wider family, for Matthew, and for others known personally to us. Lord, be at work in their lives, we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you that you have called us together to live here in community in this place. Help us to serve one another and to serve the community in which we live and worship. We give thanks for the connections that are being made with the wider community through, amongst other things, the cafe, youth work and schools work. We give thanks for the opportunity to work with Epiphany School in a new way and pray that this may be fruitful in helping the children to know more of you. May you be in further plans for clubs, and may the way be made open to once again be present at Taboa. Lord, we thank you for one another, for the variety of gifts and insights each one of us brings. We thank you for all who love and support us. We thank you that you have called us here to be your people in this place. Be with us, Lord. Reveal yourself to us. Guide us and challenge us. Love us as we seek to serve you and forgive us when we get things wrong. Keep our eyes focused on you, the way, the truth and the life. Accept these prayers, we pray, for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So can I ask you to stand, please? As we prepare to gather around the Lord's table and receive bread and wine as we remember him, we're asked to share the peace with one another. There's one real source of peace in this world of ours, and that source of peace is the truth that is Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. In a nice COVID-friendly way. And folks, as we uh, move from sharing the peace to coming to communion, can I just remind you that you'll be guided to come from either side down the middle um, to receive bread and then you'll have a little silver cup of wine and um, take that little cup of wine with you as you return to your seat. But there's a receptacle at either side, one by the piano and one by the banner over there by the door. Just place the silver cup in there out on your way back. Okay, thank you. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So the Lord invites you, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
and we pray together. Almighty God, we thank, thank you, you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And we go out with our eyes fixed on the truth, on the truth of Jesus. Let him be all that our gaze takes in. Let's stand and sing our final song this morning, <coughs> Be Thou My Vision. What is the truth? Do not fear. 
for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is the truth, all wrapped up in Jesus. So we pray, loving Heavenly Father, with thanksgiving for who you are and what that means for us and who we are in you. And Lord, we pray that we go from here this week, we go from here with our eyes fixed on you, the truth, the absolute truth, the wonderful truth, the incredible truth. And Lord, may that truth sustain us as we live our lives as disciples of yours, as we seek to share you with others. May we know that truth at work in us and around us. We commit ourselves to you for that purpose. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And as we go from here, loving Heavenly Father, may we go with your blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may that blessing be upon us this day and always. Amen. Amen. Stick around for uh, refreshments and time with one another. Remember to come back tomorrow for our Word one-to-one -one training session. And um, have a great day. God bless. <laughs>